I love dice. They're one of my favorite three-dimensional objects. They're up there with bananas and trucks. And today we're going to be building the next evolution, the future of dice, if you will, and if you want to be generous. But in order for us to build the next version of dice, we got to talk about the history of dice. So let's do that. Dice have been around for so long. We don't actually even know how long. It was before modern history. The six-sided die that we use today, it dates back to around 2200 BC, so roughly 4,000 years ago. But versions of throwable objects used for randomness in games date back to ancient Egypt and maybe even farther, we just don't know. What we do know is dice were used for gambling, as you might suspect, but they were also used for religious ceremonies, fortune telling, things like that. A lot of specifics are lost to time, but we can speculate a bit. Looking at this die from ancient Egypt, it was built around the year zero, and it's an incredibly impressive geometric object. It was probably used for divination or other ceremonies. If we fast forward almost 2000 years to the 19th century, this die in comparison looks pretty wacky, but it makes sense. This was probably just used for gambling. Over time, a lot of the spiritual elements of dice kind of faded away and it became more of just a gambling instrument. By the 1800s, we start seeing advertising as a concept evolve and we start seeing dice show up in there, generally, uh, you know, next to kind of shady products like things you smoke or things you drink. As dice became cheaper, they started becoming used by children, and especially young boys gravitated towards this idea of randomness and risk taking. These young boys become young men, they carry forward that iconography from their childhood. We start seeing dice on things like military planes. Around this same time back home, modern board games are coming onto the scene. This pulls dice out of bars and street corners and pulls it into the house. That softens the image and exposes it to multiple generations. Past the 1950s, we start seeing dice just everywhere fuzzy dice in cars, game shows, using dice, just in general, a heck of a lot of dice. And that leads us to today. I want to build the next evolution of dice, a digital handheld device that lets us roll any combination of different value dice that we might want to roll. So let's start making a plan. I know I'm going to want it to be kind of small, rectangular, something you can hold and operate in just a single hand. I want it to be a bit stylized. I'm going to add these external nibs so screws can go through those and hold the case together. It'll have a recessed OLED screen. That's going to be in color. It's going to look really nice. For more of that stylized look, I'm going to make the front panel kind of resemble like a suit a little bit, like he's a little dice helper robot. And so we're going to have a lapel, sides of his coats, and then the buttons that would be like maybe on his shirt are also buttons we can actually press. Then on the side, I'll have two buttons which are kind of important. One is for rolling and one will reset your selection of dice. For this project, I'm going to attempt to do my first circuit board for a project entirely by myself without my uh, brother's help. I know on the top of the board, we'll need holes that line up with the holes on the OLED screen module, so we'll put those up there. The heart, the brain of this thing is going to be a Raspberry Pi Pico. That'll sit kind of between the OLED module and the actual board. Then below that, we'll have holes that line up with the components that make up the front-facing buttons. Now, one of the issues with this design is that the USB port for the Pico is going to be entirely blocked, so we need to make sure we wire out the debug pins so we can still program it once it's soldered onto this daughter board. I don't want to too much with figuring out like how to do lipo charging and stuff for this project so i'm still going to use an off-the-shelf lipo charger that has a usb-c port we'll just wire that into this circuit feed the power to the pico and we'll put in you know however big a battery we can fit we'll see once it's all together for the programming we're going to use the pi pico sdk which is written in c and for the ui i'm not really sure what i want it to look like yet we'll have to see once we get in farther but i know i want you to be able to select between all the popular dice sizes and pick up to like five of them to roll at the same time. Oh, and then we need a back cover as well to get to the debug port. And if we end up having any other, you know, uh, extras in there, like we have to unplug the battery or something, I want that to be a separate compartment. So there you go, we're all done up. I think the PCB stuff is gonna be interesting to figure out. And then the rest of this should be not too tricky. We'll see, but I'm uh, just gonna color this real quick for my own, uh, own entertainment and we can get into this. Spoiler, we were not ready to get into it. That was actually three weeks ago. Now we are here, and the reason it took three weeks is because we need the PCB to get this project started, and here it is. Now, I'm not gonna get into too much about how I actually designed this specific board because there's a lot of terminology and ideas that you have to understand for that to be interesting. So to start, we're just gonna go over some high-level concepts. So next time you see a PCB, you can be like, oh, I understand what I'm looking at. 
This board specifically is an unpopulated board. It doesn't have any components soldered to it. The board is made up of a couple layers of copper and some other materials, and those layers of copper can be etched away by machines to make two-dimensional wires out of that layer of copper. Anytime you see a dark green area, that is a non-conductive area where the copper was etched away, and if you see a light green area, that is a layer that actually has a copper on it. That includes these big areas. This is called a copper fill. When you have a huge section of the board that's filled in with copper and these dark areas here are where that copper fill couldn't reach or wasn't desirable. The green layer is a protective coating. So you can't just like short directly to it. You'd have to scrape the coating away, but trust me, the copper is there. These white lines everywhere are individual footprints for components. A footprint is a combination of drill holes, solder pads, etc., and they line up with a specific component you want to mount to this. So for example, this one is for the pipe Pico. You can see that everything lines up perfectly and as a helper it has a text that says what each pin is on the board. Each of these component identifiers, which is the text and the number, correlate to a component. Some of these, like these shoulder buttons, I had to look at a data sheet, and by data sheet I mean the store page for the buttons that I bought, which if you zoom in it has in very small blurry text all the measurements for what you need to do on your PCB to get these to fit perfectly. Footprints can get really tiny. These little resistors here would be populated with very small resistors, so they have very small footprints. The last interesting concept is that you don't have to build these things entirely from scratch. There's tons of open source boards. So these pins on the top, I actually copied those directly from the open source files for the OLED module I bought. So I know they're gonna line up perfectly with the module once it arrives. I had this board manufactured at a place called Next PCB. They're not a sponsor of this video, but they do help out supplying materials and stuff for videos and they've sponsored me in the past, but still I recommend them, go check them out. But yeah, enough dilly-dallying, let's build a little dice machine. Besides our custom PCB and the Pi Pico, we're going to need that charging circuit we talked about, we'll get some headers for the debug port, we'll need a battery, four buttons for the front facing controls, two right angle buttons for the shoulders, then we'll need an adapter to plug the battery in, and that should be close to it, there's no way to know. Can't think this through any more than I already did, which was very little, so let's see how this goes. Just like a pair of French anglefish who mate for life, if we're going to permanently mate this Pico to this board, the edges of a Pi Pico are designed to be soldered like this. As a surface mount component. That's in contrast to these buttons which poke through. Those are through hole components. Through hole components are great. They hold themselves a bit and the final connection is mechanically strong. However, they poke through. So you have to design whatever you're putting your PCB in to allow for a little bit of extra room. A component I missed in the intro was this nice power switch. I wanted to show you how it clicked but those little metal points stabbed in my hand so I gave up. Off screen I soldered in that battery connector and the screen. The good news is I think the screen's gonna work. The bad news is these wires were supposed to go straight down, uh, but they did not, and I'll tell you why. When I started designing this PCB, I wasn't sure I was going to finish this project. I was just doing it as a study, so I didn't actually check logically that the wiring made sense. I just kind of put wires in there to experiment with, and then I went and I finished the rest of the board. By the time I finished everything else, I forgot that I didn't actually think anything through, and so then when I got it, the wires did not line up at all. Physically, they lined up, but the logical connection were all wrong. So off screen had to do a little extra wiring, but it all worked. We just had to move things left and right a bit. The connections to the actual Pico are just fine. We just had to make some adjustments. Although I feel confident that the wiring is now correct, I am not confident that I'm not going to break it. So let's get this thing in a case. To do the case design, as always, I used Tinkercad, but I did something different. Because I designed the PCB, I could export it as an SVG, import that SVG, and get a 3D model of the PCB to do all my design around. That way I could easily visualize things, make sure things lined up, and make sure that I'd have room for the components. I also got a new 3D printer that lets me do multicolor printing, so I'm going to try to work in some of those elements we talked about in the original design and do those in multicolor filament. Hopefully they look cool. All right, they look cool. The multicolor stuff looks real buttery, but we'll talk more about that in a second. Aside from this back cover, we also have a part that's mostly the kind of the battery area. It also mounts the PCB to it. Then we have a bracket which holds the screen in place on top of the PCB. And then finally, the front cover, which looks like our original drawing, kind of. These are both multicolored prints. The difference is the shiny one was printed face down on the bed, and the front cover was printed face up. They both look amazing, and it's going to really level up this whole build. The first step to connecting our PCB to our plastic is to kind of wiggle all the wires through these little holes. After that, a couple screws hold it in place. The next step is to take the screen bracket and then spend like 
five to ten seconds looking at it, trying to remember which way it goes, and then eventually picking a random way and crossing your fingers. Getting the screen into place is a bit delicate, you kind of have to rotate the bracket around that bundle of wires, but once it's in, you can press it down and screw in that screen. Lastly comes the front cover, which pushes down on that OLED as well to make sure it's nice and snug. I got the longest screws in my screw arsenal, and those are just barely long enough to reach all the way through, and then we can put nuts on the other side. Around back, that power switch just pressure fits into this hole in the 3D print. Our LiPo charger I modified just a bit off screen. It plugs into the USB hole, and then we have these little whips to plug into the main board, and the other one goes to the battery. Originally, I dreamed of having a nice large battery in here. That is not going to fit, so we're going with a nice small battery. Hardware-wise, we're pretty much done. I could close this thing up, but I need the cover off anyway to access that debug port. So let's figure out what the software for this is going to look like. I've been fiddling around here. I did basic UI layout. And the UI layout, I tried to maintain the spatial positioning of the buttons a bit. So you can see here we have top right button, top left, bottom left, bottom right, and then the two side actions. And the idea here is you'll be able to scroll between different dice sizes, plus or minus will add them up here to your list of active dice. And then right top button or the shoulder top that actually rolls and then the bottom one clears out your whole selection. And I did a bunch of different dice. I think they look great. Um, some of them, this one's basically like a circle, but I think they look really good. I feel very happy about how these came out. All right, it is a few hours later and things are pretty much going to plan. I found a library to interact with our screen, so that worked. So I was able to bring that in here and just start hacking away at it. I was able to go through, just use basic GPIO code from the PyPico SDK to read all the buttons. I made some functions to do stuff like draw buttons, but overall it's feeling pretty good. But yeah, just a ton of individual draw calls, drawing circles, drawing rectangles, drawing lines. Uh, I made a function to draw the icons that are in the uh, mockup. And that's pretty much the whole process. The last thing I need to test and get, and get sorted before we actually get this thing, you know, call this thing done is that dice rolling screen. I'm still not quite sure how that's going to look, but I'm going to, I'm going to figure that out on my own and we will check out the final device here in just a second. All right, final screen coded up. Now, this is how I've been programming this. This is called a Pico Probe. It's used with those debug pins we talked about earlier to program Pi Picos. The five pins we need for this are serial plus the programming pins and a ground. In theory, this is going to be version 1.0 of this software. So I'm just going to go ahead and flash it over and we will see. And there we go, Mr. Dice is alive. I'm gonna go ahead and put the back cover on and then I'll give you the tour around this place. I'll disconnect the debugger and then we just need four screws to put that cover back on. Let me tell you, this thing just feels great in your hand. It's kind of heavy, it feels like it really has a weight, the texture of the back is really cool, the whole thing, it just feels really nice to hold. The buttons are super clicky, but not in like an annoying way, they're just satisfying. I'm really proud of how the UI ended up looking. In real life, these colors are super bright and vivid. They're a little washed out on camera, but everything just really pops when you see it in person. Just like we dreamed of, you can add dice to your hand, then hitting that side button, that sends us into the rolling screen. One click for each roll, and then at the end of that, you get a total of all the numbers you just rolled. Just like I wanted, it works really great in one hand. It just feels really comfortable to use. And yeah, I mean, man, this one, this one came out just really really good like it's exactly what i wanted i think it's the closest thing to a perfect build that i've done on this channel it is just exactly what i dreamed of and it works it's super reliable it just it just is exactly what i wanted and like i said in the beginning this wasn't meant to really be a finished project i was just trying to practice doing pcb stuff and all that and you know we built something cool but man we've unlocked a lot of potential for the next build and the next build so that's the good news the bad news is if you've been following the channel lore you probably know i've been doing this full time for about a year sadly it's just not sustainable so going forward i'm gonna have to go back to working a normal job which means fewer videos but what it does mean that is good is that we're 
we're going to have more resources to do bigger projects. We won't be dependent on sponsors to keep the channel going. So I think like quality wise, everything going forward is going to be better, bigger than what we've been able to do before. And I think honestly, I'm going to enjoy it more. Not that I have, I've, I've enjoyed it so far a ton, but I think there's just going to be a ton of joy in doing it just for fun. So yeah, I appreciate everyone who supported the channel this far. We're definitely not stopping, but don't be freaked out if there's fewer videos or you know an inconsistent uploading schedule, especially for the next few months. But don't worry, ton of cool stuff is in the channel, in, in the can for the channel. I mean, if you look at my desk in the background of this video, you'll see half a dozen upcoming video sneak peeks. So don't worry if I'm not around a little bit, but things are coming, we're building, we're, we're going to do some great stuff. So thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.